of the first concert I came to, uh, we were sat in the choir seats uh, and Hulse Planet was playing and just blew me away. I didn't know this music, I didn't know orchestral music really, um, but just the experience and the physicality of it actually, particularly sat so close, was uh, something that I, I still remember very clearly. Flash forward many years, because I went away and worked outside Liverpool, I came into this job um, uh, six years ago in 2008. And I'd had a lot to do with the film professionally before that in my previous job as Regional Director for Arts Council England. There is something very special about seeing a uh, performance in that hall when you're Chief Executive of the organisation and you know, have that degree of ownership of it. And it's a real privilege, to be honest, to be able to see the orchestra particularly playing as well as they are at the moment, but also uh, the extraordinary range of you know, pop artists, folk artists and so on that we have come through. You're involved in putting on concerts uh, whether by the orchestra or by other artists who, as a kid, you know, were concerts that you might have paid money to go and see or, or, or you know, kind of heroes of yours, you know. And I think one of the things that's a real strength of um, this organisation is that we do feel part of the city. Um, and I think the city, for the most part, is very proud of Liverpool Philharmonic, whether it's the hall, you know, so many people have been through the hall, whether it's to graduate or, or attend concerts or whatever, or the orchestra. Um, even if they've not been, it, it is genuinely true, I think, that you meet people who they certainly know who we are and they like that we're here in the city and they associate us with the city. And I think that's very important. I think if um, particularly orchestras are to continue to thrive through the rest of this century, um, we need to be really connected with our location. We can't be a, a, an organisation that somehow sits apart and that's for just a you know, narrow band of the population, which is perhaps the slightly, I think, misinformed but cliched view of what an organisation like ours can be. I think we have to be deep rooted in the city. So I have huge ambitions around continuing to grow our education programme, continue to grow projects like In Harmony, where every primary school child in West Everton is learning to play an instrument and playing in the West Everton Children's Orchestra. And, you know, I would hope in some years' time that there'll be children coming through that who'll end up in the orchestra and that the impact of that programme will be growing right across the city because we can uniquely do that in a way that nobody else can do. That's one of the benefits of having this extraordinary asset of, you know, 70 or 80 incredible professional musicians and artists working in the city. Not many cities have that and we really need to make use of it. But at the same time as being connected in that way, we also have to be as ambitious as we can be for our position within what is an international world of orchestral music and performance. We have to be aspiring to be uh, and be one of the very best, not just in this country, which we are already, but you know, worldwide, and to be recognised for that. And those two things feed off each other. If you're genuinely world-class in, in your quality and international in your outlook, I think that adds value to how you engage locally. And equally, if you engage locally, you're kind of rooted in your place and it supports that wider endeavour. Um, so absolutely that ambition, and ambition for the whole... Um, to continue to be as successful as it is, to continue to present music right across the board. Again, we're, there are very, very few organisations in this country who do as much as we do, who will put on the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra one night and Elvis Costello the next and a new young British folk artist the night after that and our own youth orchestra or youth choir the night after that. I love that breadth, and I think that's something that we have to continue to build in the, in the years and decades ahead. Probably at the age of six or seven, most children, the biggest room they've been in, will have been their school hall. And to suddenly come into this mammoth auditorium, the Philharmonic Hall, and see you know, a hall with 1,600 seats plus is quite an experience. I do remember that all the school children used to sing a rhyme, a playground rhyme about the nuddies on the wall. Um, I don't remember all the words, so I'm not going to sing them now for you, but I do know that they still exist. And I was amused to hear that that is still sung sometimes in the playgrounds today. So, yes, very clear memories of coming into the hall in the 60s for school's concerts. Well, having become influenced by the school's concerts, I then took up the violin at school. 
and latterly joined the Merseyside Youth Orchestra in 1975. As soon as I joined that orchestra, there were opportunities to be able to become involved in the backstage activities of helping the orchestra run through its own members committee and doing everything from helping out with the schedules to putting music out. And for me, that was a moment when my life changed because I realised I loved being backstage. I didn't want to be on the platform playing professionally. Regardless of the concerts, one of course, most recently, Petrenko's concerts are amazing and certainly the Shostakovich cycle has been something I'll never forget. It's been incredible to be able to actually also have the recordings of those concerts done as well and the Rachmaninoff symphonies uh, I especially remember. But you know going back I've seen quite a few principal conductors in my time now and each of them have given me a memory of, of things that I'll never forget. Um, you know, with Sir Charles Groves, there's so much English music he brought out and he conducted the youth orchestra as well. Todd Hanley, all the Vaughan Williams symphonies and the Dream of Gerontius. Ironically, we did the Dream of Gerontius with Todd Handley the night that Sir Charles Groves passed away. And I remember coming out of the cathedral and being told of this as, as we left, and it was one of those things you think just, it was just meant to be. And other conductors who've given us amazing music, it's, there's just too, too many things to, to list, really. Liverpool Phil is one of the longest recording orchestras there is. It has one of the longest recording histories, certainly in the UK especially. It recorded Messiah with Huddersfield Choral Society many, many years ago. The first performance of Bolton's Belshazzar Feast was done in the Philharmonic Hall um, and it was done without the brass bands. And Mendelssohn's Elijah was done with Sir Malcolm Sargent. Those I have on 78s. The most recent ones we've done with, with Petrenko, the Shostakovich title has been incredible. That's brought us worldwide recognition in the age of the internet and, and the web today. A recording can make history for an orchestra in seconds. It was much harder in the 60s when you had to rely on the sales for the local record shop to actually get your profile out there. Another thing that we did which was completely out of the blue was to have made a connection with Paul McCartney and he wrote his Liverpool Oratorio for the 150th anniversary way back in 1990. And having performed it in Liverpool and recorded it, we were then invited to go and take it to Carnegie Hall in New York. And I had less than seven weeks from the first phone call to the date of the concert to put the whole thing together in November 1991. That was an amazing time because, A, you could, can't imagine taking the orchestra to Carnegie Hall for the first time, but B, the glamour <laughs> around a sort of pop setup was completely different from what we're, we're used to working with Liverpool Phil. So that was completely different as well. And I think our strength has been that Liverpool Phil has constantly reinvented itself, explored new fields, gone in new directions, looked at new things to do. If you look down the 50s and 60s when Sir John Pritchard was here, the whole Music of Eva series where he would have a Friday evening get the audience along, not tell them what they're going to hear. Sometimes they would hear Schubert Fire, which I know already. Sometimes it would be a completely new work by Gurr or somebody. And he would just explain it to them and talk about it. And they didn't know what they'd hear. And it was an amazing series. And you, you, you know, the audience learnt so much and they experienced so much. Things they probably wouldn't have bought a ticket for, but they enjoyed when they came along. Mm -hmm.